The words which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the Gospel according to St. Luke in the fourth chapter and the 18th verse. The 18th verse in the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I want in particular this evening to consider one phrase only in that great statement, namely the the phrase in which our Lord says that God had sent him to heal the broken hearted. Now those of you who are looking at the revised version will find that you haven't got that phrase. It seems to me a great pity that the revisers following certain texts rather than others should have omitted a phrase which is to be found in the Hebrew of the 61st chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah out of which this whole quotation comes and also in the translation of the Semti, the Septuagint. But there it is. It's not in the Revised and others, but it's here in the authorized version. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now, we come back once more to this statement. We began considering it last Sunday evening. And we thus are spending time with it because it is obviously a very crucial statement. It uh, is a statement that was made by our Lord at the very commencement of his public ministry. The context, you remember, is this. Our Lord had set out to preach at the age of 30. He had gone to John the Baptist and had asked him to baptize him, and he was baptized. And as he was there coming up out of the water the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then we are told that our Lord was driven, led of the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan forty days and forty nights. And we remember how he repulsed him and repelled him and vanquished him. And then we are told after that he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book he found the place where it is written the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and so on. It was in other words the 61st chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. And our Lord, having read uh, that uh, first verse out of the 61st chapter of Isaiah's prophecy, handed the book back and sat down and began to speak. And this is what he said. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. In other words, he there says and claims that what Isaiah had prophesied about 800 years before was a prophecy concerning him. That he is the fulfillment of that prophecy. He is the one upon whom the Spirit of the Lord has come. It came at the baptism. There he was anointed. And the voice came saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here, in his own hometown, as it were, he goes into the synagogue on the Sunday and he lets them know exactly what his message is. He says, that's my message. That's why I've come. That is what I have to say. Now, we learn elsewhere in the Gospels that the voice of God also spoke concerning him on the Mount of Transfiguration. There were Peter and James and John with him and they saw him transfigured and transformed 
His very clothing began to shine with a brightness that no fuller on earth can ever produce. And suddenly there came the voice again saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. That's what God commends the world tonight, is to listen to his Son. Well, therefore, I say, the most important thing for us is to know what the Son says. God has assured us that the answer to all our problems and to all our questions is to be found in this Son of His, this well-beloved Son, in whom He is well pleased. And we are to listen to Him. Well, what does He say? Well, here He answers the question. This is His message. He says here that this is why he has come into the world, that God has sent him to do this very thing. And what a wonderful statement it is. He hath anointed me, he says, and sent me to preach the gospel, glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to give deliverance to captives, to give sight to the blind, and so on. What wonderful words, what gracious words. That's what he said away back nearly 2,000 years ago in that synagogue in Nazareth. But my dear friends, that's what he's saying still. That's what he's saying tonight. That's his proclamation to the world as it is at this hour. This is his message. We are told in that same record that some of those people were rather amazed when they heard these gracious words coming over his lips. But do you remember that as he went on to speak, they became infuriated. And we are told that they so hated him that they tried to throw him down to destruction from the brow of the hill just outside the town. But he walked miraculously through them all and escaped. But how do you explain this? How is it possible that anybody should feel hatred to one who speaks such gracious words? Surely you would have thought that everybody would have grasped them. Everyone would have taken the words and the speaker to their bosoms and would have thanked God for him and would have gone after him. But they didn't. His, face, his fate was to be rejected of men. His fate was to be despised. His fate was to be crucified. They preferred a robber to him. They said, away with him, crucify him. Now that's the great problem that confronts us as we read our four Gospels, that anybody could, could reject such gracious words, such a wonderful offer. But it's still the same. And that's the tragedy of the world this evening. We're all talking about the atomic bomb and hydrogen bomb as if that's the tragedy and the problem. My dear friends, the real problem is this. Why is it that the whole world isn't listening to this Son of God and following him and living life as he would have us live it? If they did, there'd be no problem about the atomic bomb nor any other bomb. This is the primary question. And that is why I call your attention to it. Why is it, I say, that men are not thrilled by these words? There's only one answer. It's because they don't realize their need of him. It's because they don't realize the truth about themselves. It's because they don't realize their condition. To put it in a word, it's because they don't understand what is meant by the word sin. Now, this is a very simple principle, isn't it? If you are in desperate need of something, and suddenly somebody comes along and offers you that very thing, oh, how glad you are, how you rejoice, and you show it. You say, I don't know what to say to you, I don't know how to thank you. You're beaming with smiles, you clap your hands perhaps, and you go and tell everybody. Our Lord has pictured all that, hasn't he? He's told us about the joy of the shepherd who lost a sheep, about the woman who lost a coin, about the father who lost a son, and how in each case, when they find them, oh, how they rejoice. 
If you are desperately ill and in pain, you're delighted to see the doctor coming through the door, aren't you? You know he's got something in the bag that can relieve you. There's no need to argue with you about it. There's no need to convince you that you're in pain and that you need help. You know it, and therefore when you see him, thank God, you say. But here is the Son of God. Come down from heaven to earth. Even dying a shameful death upon a cross. And telling us that he is doing so for us. And we all pass by and say irrelevant. Sob stuff. All right for women and children, but not meeting the facts of life. He's ignored. No one pays attention. Why? Well, I've already given you the answer. They don't realize their need of him. They're not aware of their condition apart from him. In other words, I say, they've never understood what is meant by the word sin. Because you notice that our Lord in his statement, in his dealing with this uh, quotation from the 61st chapter of Isaiah, what he really says there is this, that he has come into the world in order to deal with the problem of sin. He makes use of these ancient words of Isaiah because there Isaiah has collected together a number of very wonderful pictures which depict sin. That's what they are. These are pictures. He's not talking literally about uh, the poor. We saw last Sunday night he means the poor in spirit. He isn't talking about a literal broken heart. If a heart is literally broken, it's death and nothing can be done. No, no, these are all pictures. Likewise with the captives and the blind and all the others. Marvelous portrayals, depictions of the effects of sin upon men. And our Lord, therefore, in other words, is saying quite plainly that he is here in the world. He has come from heaven. He sets out in his ministry in order to deal with this whole problem of sin. And it's a very simple sermon, this, which he preached there. And it's really very plain. Let's put it like this. Sin is one condition. It's a disease. But it shows itself in many different ways. It has many symptoms. I think that's the simplest way of putting it. One disease may have many symptoms. There are many diseases, for instance, that give you a headache and a dry tongue. Those are but symptoms of one disease. And there may be one disease, think of a disease like pneumonia. There's terrible trouble in your lung. Yes, but in addition, there is the headache, there is the fever, there is the thirst and all the rest of it. Many symptoms, one disease. Now, sin is exactly like that. There is but one sin in mankind, and that there is but one disease in mankind, and that is sin. But it's almost protean in its manifestations. And here we are given some of them in this wonderful picture. So you notice that they all rarely describe the same essential condition, but in different ways. We are looking at different aspects. And yet there are certain things that are common to them all. And the first thing that is common to them all is this. That it is only those who realize what they are suffering from who derive the benefit. The Lord Jesus Christ, as we saw last Sunday night, says that he has come to preach the gospel to the poor. And the gospel of Christ is only gospel, it's only good news to those who realize how poor they are. The Pharisees didn't regard it as good news at all. The self-righteous today see nothing in it. Why? Well, they've never realized their own poverty. So I put again the question I put last Sunday night. Do you regard this gospel as the greatest good news you've ever heard? If you don't, you're not only not a Christian, you're telling me that you've never seen your poverty in a spiritual sense. And it's exactly the same with this second picture which we're going to look at this evening. Here's another manifestation of sin. 
And our Lord says with respect to it that he's come to heal it. But you see, the only people who are going to be healed by Christ are those who realize that they've got broken hearts and those who are sick and those who are ill. He said himself, didn't he, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The only people who can say tonight, Christ has healed me, are those who've known that they've been sick. Very well then, let's look at this picture together. Last Sunday night we were looking at sin as it leads to poverty, to penury. Sin is something which makes us beggars. Tonight we are looking at it in a different form, and here it is. It's something that leads to a broken heart. I am come, I am sent to heal the broken hearted. What's he mean? What is his teaching at this point? Well, I want to suggest to you that the best answer to that question, or if you like, the best commentary on this phrase, is just to go back to the 61st chapter of Isaiah and read the context there. For there, I think I can show you, is a perfect exposition of what, it is, what is meant by being broken-hearted. So I divide my matter in this form. Sin is something that leads to a broken-hearted condition. What does that mean? Well, let me analyze it as best I can. It includes these things. It means, first of all, failure. Sin always leads to failure. Sin is that which causes everything finally to go to pieces. Now that's put very clearly in a pictorial form in the third and fourth verses of Isaiah's chapter. He says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And then, and they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. That's a wonderful description of it. Failure. What sort of failure? Well, it's this sort of failure according to the picture. You're walking along a road and suddenly you see a tree that has been blown down. Not a great majestic oak standing, uh, erect as ever, but a slender sort of tree blown down by the wind, by the gale, the hurricane. It didn't seem to have any strength in it. It didn't seem to stand upright in righteousness, bent and blown down and torn. Or another way you can look at it is this. It leads to a kind of wilderness, to a kind of waste. They shall build the old wastes, a sort of barren and productive soil, a kind of wilderness, instead of being a fruitful land. And then another picture he uses is that it's a picture of waste, desolate cities, towns in ruins, everything broken down. Now that, according to the Bible, is something which sin always tends to do. Sin leads to failure. Things are not as they ought to be. Instead of that upright tree, bent and broken. Instead of fruitful fields, no crops at all, desolate, barren. Instead of a city built up and inhabited and rejoicing, waste, rubble, ruins, houses broken down, streets in disorder, everything's gone wrong. That, according to the Bible, from beginning to end is what sin always does. It makes havoc of life. It turns life into a failure. That's the first thing about this broken-hearted condition. Are you a failure, my friend? 
Are you very pleased with yourself tonight as you review your life? Is everything going well? Are you what you were meant to be? Have you succeeded in doing what you set out to do? How are you getting on in your moral life? What's the condition of your chastity and your purity? What's your mind like? What's your imagination like? Is all well? Are you successful? Is everything flourishing? Are you proud of it? Are you pleased with it? Are you rejoicing in it all? Have you stood up to life? Are you a success or are you a failure? That's the question the Bible asks. Sin always leads to failure. Man was made in the image of God. He was meant to be Lord of creation. He was meant to reflect something, the perfection of the eternal himself. What is he? Well, look at the world. And you see nothing but desolation. You see nothing but waste. You see nothing but ruin. Failure. It's true of all. It's true of the individual. But it doesn't stop at that, you see. There's something further, and that is the sense of shame that accompanies this. Because the brokenhearted are conscious of their failure, and they bemoan their failure, and they hate themselves for their failure, and they can't forgive themselves for their failure. A sense of shame. The men put it once in a hymn by putting it like this. The ruins of my soul repair. And dwell without a rival there. Do you know what it is to have a sense of shame? Do you know what it is to feel that you can scarcely forgive yourself? Having resolved never to fall to that thing again, you've fallen again. And you hate yourself. And you're amazed at yourself. And you despise yourself. You say, how could I have done it again? What brought me? A sense of shame. It's always a part of this broken-hearted condition. Is there no sense of shame in you, my friend? Is all well with your soul? I ask, are you perfectly content with yourself? Are you congratulating yourself? Or are there things in your life at this moment of which you're so ashamed that you've never mentioned them to anybody and you wouldn't dare do so. You'd be ashamed to tell them. The brokenhearted are aware of this shame and in turn it's accompanied by a sense of despair. Yeah, there's all the difference in the world, isn't there, between just feeling sorry and being brokenhearted. The man who's merely sorry, who feels a little pang of remorse, says, Ah, oh, I'll put that right. I'll never do that again. I'll be all right next time. I was a fool there. I shouldn't have done it. Never again. That's remorse. It doesn't last long. He goes back and does it again. But here is someone broken-hearted. Why? Well, for this reason. They've so often determined to put things right. They've so often pledged and vowed that they'll never do it again. They are determined to live a holy and a godly and a religious life. But try as they will, they fail again and go down. And there's a sense of despair. Broken-hearted, not passing remorse, but a realization that the situation seems hopeless, that nothing can be done. And, of course, this all finally leads to the condition described here as one of mourning. It leads to intense misery and wretchedness and mourning. Uh, what is the position? Well, here's the picture. It's somebody sitting on the, on the ground in the dust, and he's put ashes on his head, and he's put sackcloth on his body. Ashes. And a kind of garment which suits the spirit of heaviness. Did you notice the terms? To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That's the picture of a broken-hearted person. Sackcloth and ashes. No brightness. No joy on the face. No joy in the life, in the gait, in the walk in the whole approach to others, but self-condemnation 
unhappy. Failing to sleep at night, going over and over it, can't get rid of it. Morning, ashes, sackcloth, the spirit of heaviness. Life has become a burden. The man's become a burden to himself. He doesn't know what to do with himself. He can't rouse himself. He realizes he's mastered by sin and he's wretched and he's unhappy. Everything seems to have gone wrong. Life has become a failure. He says, can't I do anything right? He looks at his whole life and existence. He remembers how he began. He looks at what he is. He sees nothing but failure and shame and therefore he's wretched and miserable and unhappy about it all. It's to people like that that Jesus Christ comes. And you know, my friends, it's only, as I said just now, to people like that, that he does come. You read your Bible and you'll find everywhere that it's people who've had that sort of experience who know him and who rejoice in his salvation. Take a man like King David, for instance, the sweet psalmist, the sweet singer of Israel. This is how he puts it. Create within me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He's in the depths. Out of the depths cry I unto thee. And then you remember how he puts it again in that selfsame 51st Psalm. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. It's people who know something like that are the ones who know the healing of the Lord. Listen to Isaiah indeed putting it very well in a great verse in the 57th chapter of this prophecy of his. This is how he puts it. The Lord is speaking through him. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. This is the paradox of God and of redeeming grace. He dwells, the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Who are the people who know him and who dwell with him? The humble, contrite, broken hearts and nobody else. Not your Pharisee. Not your self-righteous person, not the self-satisfied one, the broken-hearted. But listen to it in the New Testament. The world probably has never known a man who has known so much what it was to rejoice and to be truly happy as the Apostle Paul. No man perchance ever knew Christ as well as he did. He could even say to live to me to live is Christ and to die is gain that I might be with Christ which is far better. He knew him. He loved him. He rejoiced in him. What brought him there? He tells us himself. It's the same man who said on one occasion Oh, wretched men that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He was broken-hearted. Why? Well, because he realized his sinfulness. He realized this foul, devilish, hellish thing that was within him. To will is present with me, but how to perform, I know not. I love the law of God with my mind, but I find another law in my members Opposed to the law of God, dragging me down, making me a slave. The evil that I would not, that I do. And the good that I would, I do not. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's the sort of man who knows Jesus Christ. That's the sort of man who knows what it is to be healed by Christ. To heal the broken-hearted. So I ask you the obvious question at this point. Are you rejoicing in Jesus Christ? Do you love him? 
Are you thrilled by the very thought of his name? Can you say honestly in your heart this evening, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds to this believer's ear? Can you say that? If you can't, my friend, there's only one reason for it. You've never been broken-hearted. Your heart's never been broken about yourself. You've never faced yourself. You've never seen yourself. No, no, don't think you can get away with it by saying, ah, but I've always lived a good and a decent and a moral and a religious life. If that's your argument, I just send you straight again to Saul of Tarsus. He leaves you hopelessly in the shade, and yet he was broken-hearted about himself as was Charles Wesley, a most exemplary, moral, good, religious young man who spent his life doing good. This is what he says, Just and holy is thy name. I am all unrighteousness, vile and full of sin I am. That's the sort of man who can say, Thou, O Christ, art all I want. More than all in thee I find Jesus, lover of my soul. Has your heart been broken? If it hasn't, I say it's simply because you've never examined yourself. You've never faced yourself. You've never read your scriptures truly. You've never pictured yourself standing before God in holiness and eternal justice. You've never looked at the vile, foul things that are in you as they're in all of us by nature. That's why you've never known what it is to be healed. That's the condition. But oh, if you are brokenhearted, if you've come to this service because you know that you're a failure and because you're miserable and wretched and unhappy and can't forgive yourself and are sitting metaphorically in dust and ashes with sackcloth upon your skin, I have a wonderful message for you. He says, I am come to heal the brokenhearted. How does he do it? Well, let me put it like this to you. Let me tell you what he doesn't do and how important this is. How does he heal? Well, he heals in this way. He doesn't condemn. He doesn't merely condemn. There's a very wonderful statement about him again by Isaiah, quoted by our Lord in another place. He says, he shall not cry aloud. The bruised reed he shall not break, and the smoking flax he shall not quench. What a wonderful picture of him. He hasn't come to condemn and to destroy. He hasn't come in a sense to judge. His coming does judge, but he hasn't come in order to judge and to condemn. No, no, this is the amazing paradox, I say again, that he, though he was what he was, is the one of all others who doesn't condemn. Let me give you the illustrations. Do you remember on one occasion he went at the invitation of a Pharisee into his house to have a meal? And the moment he sat down and reclined, a poor woman came who was a notorious sinner in the town and she simply fell at his feet and washed his feet with her tears and then began to wipe them with the hair of her head. And we are told the Pharisee, watching all this, said, If this man were the prophet that he claims to be, he would know exactly the character of this woman who was there washing his feet with her tears and he'd send her out through the door. He obviously doesn't know it. Oh, poor Pharisee, he doesn't understand. He has come to seek and to save a woman like that. He's interested. He doesn't condemn. But there's a still more specific instance, you remember, in the 8th chapter of John's Gospel. The Pharisees and the experts in religious matter brought him one, a woman one day and they said, now then, come along, we want your judgment. We have caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Now then, what you say about her? And do you remember how he dealt with the situation? He began writing something on the sand and he said to the men who had brought her along, he that is without sin amongst you, let him first cast a stone. And they all simply slunk out of sight. 
And our Lord lifted up his head and looked at the woman and said, Woman, where are these thine accusers? And then he looked at her and said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He didn't condemn her. He hadn't come to condemn. Sin produces the condemnation against the law of God. There is the condemnation. He hasn't come to condemn. This is very important, this negative. There was nothing about him that so astounded and amazed and annoyed the Pharisees and the doctors of the law as the fact that he was one who sat down amongst publicans and sinners. He sat amongst publicans and sinners and he ate and he drank with them. And they said, this man is a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. They wouldn't look at them. They wouldn't sit near them. They hated them and abhorred them. He comes to them, mixes with them. Why? He hasn't come to condemn. The business of the physician is not only to diagnose. He has come to heal. But secondly... He has not simply come to exhort them to live a better life or to hold up an example and a standard and to teach them to imitate him. No, no. Thank God it isn't this. I know nothing that makes me feel so utterly hopeless as the idea that I've got to imitate Jesus Christ. I can't satisfy myself. I can't satisfy you. Who am I to imitate? Jesus Christ, who are you? Thank God I say he hasn't come merely to give an example and to say, look at me, live like this, this is how you ought to be. Here is my command, carry it out. Impossible, I say. Thank God he hasn't come to do that. No, no. He has come to heal. He has come to do something positive. He's come to bind up the brokenhearted. He's come to heal the sickness, the disease. How does he do it? Well, he does it like this. He does it by just being what he is. The medical illustration is obvious, isn't it? There are some doctors whose personalities do you more good than their medicines. And rightly so. You say, you know, the moment he came into the door, I began to feel better. Quite right. It's literally true. It's an essential part of the work of the physician. And the Lord Jesus Christ heals partly by being what he is. Sympathetic. Meek and lowly, come unto me, he says. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come and take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. He doesn't reject your candidates. He doesn't dismiss your failures. Come, he says, I've come for people like you. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. So that when you see him and he comes near to you, you feel that at last here is someone who understands. Do you remember that what we are told about that poor man of Gadara who had a legion of devils within him? We are told that he spent his time up amongst the mountains and in the tombs cutting himself with stones. He didn't want to be with people. And yet we are told that when he saw Jesus he ran to him. And everybody like that always did run to him. Then drew nigh unto him, publicans and sinners, for to hear him. He seemed to be a magnet attracting them all. Why? Well, because he was what he was. He looked different. There was something about his face, his very stance, his whole approach. There was something that oozed out sympathy and love divine. He himself, of course, as usual has given the perfect picture of it all in that parable of the Samaritan which I read to you at the beginning out of the 10th chapter of Luke's Gospel. There's the wounded man by the roadside. The priest sees, turns away, goes on. The Levite, no time, he must go and do his duty. The other man comes, 
And he sees him, and he crosses the road, and he examines him, and he pours in oil and wine. That's Christ. That's a picture of the Incarnation. What is the Son of God doing in this world at all? God says of him, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. He is the only begotten Son of God. The eternal Son has entered into time. He's walked the face of this earth. Why has he come? What's he doing here? There's only one answer. It is this divine compassion. It is this eternal sympathy. It is this grief in his eternal heart, if I may so say so, as he looks upon men in failure and sin and shame, in sackcloth and ashes. He came down from heaven because of the sorrow of his heart. That's why he was here at all. So he begins to heal, you see, by just being what he is, the meek and lowly Jesus. God's eternal heart of love incarnate. And he comes and takes his seat by the side of failures and miserable wretches in their rags. When the Pharisees and scribes are rejecting him and arguing with him and throwing stones at him, he takes his place with the others, the harlots and the publicans. He understands. He sympathizes. He wouldn't have come into into the world at all if man were a success. It's because man is a failure and a hopeless failure that he's come at all. His very presence begins to heal, but he doesn't stop at that. He not only shows that he understands, he comforts. I like that picture that he uses in the case of the Samaritan. The first thing he put into the wound was oil. The first need is comfort and encouragement. So that Isaiah, when he prophesied the coming of the Son of God, begins like this. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Comfort. We need it. We are hopeless. We are failures. Can anything be done? The world can't help. Men can't help. I can't help myself. Here is one who says, I can. Listen. Comfort. But he hasn't merely come to comfort us. Comfort's a wonderful thing, but it isn't enough. Comfort, while very precious, doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't bind the heart together again. No, no, he has come to heal. How does he heal? Well, this is the wine that our Lord speaks of that the Samaritan put into the wound after he'd put in the oil. You know, this is the glory of the gospel, that it really does work. It isn't something that makes you feel a little bit happier while you're listening to it, and then you go back and are left to yourself and where you were before. No, no. He says, I am come to heal the brokenhearted, to put us right. The gospel of Christ is not palliative, it's curative. It's not merely to encourage, I say, it's to deliver. How does he do it? Well, he does it like this. Let me tell you this glorious gospel once more. The Lord Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth to deal with the disease itself. To deal with sin. Sin, I say, is the cause of all the troubles it separates us from God. We are no longer blessed by God and therefore all our lives are a failure. Well, what does he do? Well, he has come to reconcile us to God. There I sit in sackcloth and ashes, bemoaning my failure. I can't forgive myself. I say, how can God forgive me? Christ comes and says, listen to me. I came from heaven to earth to bear the responsibility of your sin. I took your sins upon me and your guilt, and I bore your punishment on that cross on Calvary's hill. God has punished your sin in me, and he gives you a free pardon. Listen, believe that. That's how he does it. And he thereby reconciles me to God and restores me to God's favor. And God now smiles upon me and begins to bless me. But not only that, he gives me also a new hope. 
I say it's a wonderful thing to be told in that chapel that God forgives my sins, but I've got to go back again into the world, and I know the world will be the same, and I shall be tempted. If not tonight, tomorrow, perhaps next week, in a month, in a year, the devil is there, and the world and its way. How can I stand against it all? That's what makes me feel so hopeless. Listen, says Christ. I have not only borne the consequences of your sin. I have come to give you a new life. A new nature. A new start. A new beginning. I have come to make you a new man, a new woman. Now this is healing. You see, merely to get rid of certain consequences isn't enough. The disease must be got rid of. And he gets rid of it by putting new life into us. You can only overcome infection by building up resistance. And he puts into you the resistance of himself and his own blessed life. We are born of the Spirit. We are born again. We become partakers of the divine nature. Christ in us. And the power of the Spirit to oust sin, to get rid of the pollution. And he'll build you up. And he'll strengthen you. And he will establish you as you submit to his treatment. And he will give you a new righteousness and a new holiness and a new life entirely. And he'll enable you to overcome the devil when he tempts you. Now that is true healing, isn't it? You go out to the hospital a new man. The old disease has gone and you've got new health and strength and life and power. And what's the inevitable result of all this? Well, the result is you're a very happy person. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes. What's that mean? It means this. There was the man sitting in the dust and he'd put ashes on his head. What does Christ do? He brushes off the ashes and puts on instead a crown. That's a better translation of this word beauty. Or if you like, a tiara. A tiara for ashes. A crown for dust. Stand up, he says. Not only that, listen. The oil of joy for mourning. Stand upon your feet, he says. Wash your face. Oil it. Put on the perfume. Let it be redolent. Let everybody know about it. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Take off that sackcloth, says Christ. Cease your mourning. Put on a bright colored garment fit for rejoicing and for happiness. Come with me into the feast that we may rejoice together. That's the real test of life and of health. Once you've been healed of your disease, you no longer worry about it, do you? You no longer worry about it and spend your time in thinking about it? Not at all. You walk out of the hospital and you go home and you say, Now then, I'm going to show you how well I am. You run up the stairs. You could scarcely crawl up them before. You want everybody to know it. You're rejoicing. You're happy. What a wonderful thing, you say. It is to be healthy again and full of vigor and of power. Rejoice with me. The psychology of this passage in Isaiah is very profound. And I want to put it to you like this. You are not healed by Christ unless you are rejoicing. It's an absolute test. If you are not rejoicing in Christ tonight and in your salvation, there's something wrong somewhere with your healing. You're not trusting him at some point or other. You're saying, oh yes, but... And the moment you say that, you're back on the floor with the sackcloth and the ashes. No, no, he wants you to rejoice. He heals. It's a perfect work. It's a complete work. Beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Are you still subject to the spirit of heaviness? Are you sad and doubtful and hesitant and mourning? You say, well, I do believe in Christ, but you know my sins. My friend, can't you see he's covered them all? 
Are you still trying to work up your own righteousness? Can't you see you must rely only upon him? And that if you do rely upon him, you can say with top lady, the terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. No, no, you're not properly healed unless you're rejoicing. Are you rejoicing, I ask? This is how Charles Wesley again puts it. He speaks, Christ speaks. And listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice. The humble poor believe. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The triumphs of my God and King. The glory, the glory of my God and King. The triumphs of His grace. Are you one of the triumphs of His grace? Has He healed you? Is your mournful broken heart that was rejoicing in Him? That's what He's come to do. And if you truly listen to him, he will lead you to that. The Paul who cried out in agony, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Immediately adds, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. My friend, are you thanking God through Jesus Christ? Are you, are you realizing that he was sent and came from heaven and to earth in order to heal you? Have you seen your desperate need? And have you believed him when he has told you that he can heal you completely and enable you to rejoice in him? If not, I say... Read your Bible again. Read the lives of the saints. And give yourself no rest nor peace until you've seen the sin in your heart. And then turn to him. And submit yourself to him. And tell him to have his own way with you. And he will heal your diseases. And put a new song in your mouth and in your heart. And you will go after him, rejoicing, clothed with the garments of Zion. Amen.